Introductions. Seeing none, it is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. The people of Ottawa deserve a government that is going to stand up for them. And as I said on Monday, Hydro Ottawa has requested a rate increase for families who conserve energy. It makes no sense. If you conserve energy, you would pay more. Yet this government won't condemn that plan. Mr. Speaker, here is another chance directly to the Premier to admit, to say here in the Legislature that that plan is absurd. Will the Premier tell the OEB that families shouldn't be punished for conserving energy? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh as I have uh, as I've said to the leader of the uh, opposition, um, those decisions in terms of increases or not are made by the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Speaker. I think he, he knows that, and yeah, it is up to the does. Ontario Energy Board to look at the, uh, look at the factors that are uh, laid before it and to, uh, to make that decision. And as we know, Mr. Speaker, sometimes the OEB grants uh, an increase and sometimes they do not, Mr. Speaker, and it's up to them to make that decision. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. When the Premier wants to get involved and have her PST rebate, then she can get involved in hydro. But all of a sudden, right now, she can't get involved because the people of Ottawa, she thinks it's appropriate that they're charged more for conserving energy. It's absurd. But then again, Mr. Speaker, this is the same Premier that has overcharged the people of Ontario by $9.2 billion for renewable contracts. This is the same Premier, this is the same government that has taken $1.3 million in donations from some 30 companies for the Ontario Liberal Party for bad policy. So my question is, Mr. Speaker, rates are going to go up on November 1st, long before any Band-Aid solution. Will the Premier do the right thing? Does her government refuse to condemn this possible rate increase? Do the right thing. Help families suffering you. with your disastrous hydro policy. Mr. Speaker, please. A uh, general reminder for everyone, please, uh, to the chair. Uh, no, no personal conversations. Everything's put to the chair, both answer and question. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity this morning to meet with the uh, governor of Arizona, and we had uh, we had a number of very um, fruitful conversations about uh, issues that uh, we are both dealing with in our jurisdiction. But one of them we had, Mr. Speaker, was about energy, and we talked about the fact that in Ontario we have shut down the coal-fired plants, that we have invested in our electricity grid, Mr. Speaker, and uh, you know the uh, the folks in Arizona are looking at jurisdictions. Yeah. Like ours, as they, as they make decisions about climate change, Mr. Speaker. So, um, we we have taken steps. In this province, Mr. Speaker, we have a 90% emissions-free grid. We've invested in what was Order. an unreliable and a dirty electricity grid, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Keep it down, please. Finish. No smog days this, this year, Mr. Speaker. Answer. That's because of decisions that we have made on the electricity grid in Ontario. Okay. Just before you rise. Uh, right after I ask for uh, and I hear something else, it's just a signal that you're not going to listen. So if that's going to happen, I'm going to move to warnings. Uh, you now have your first warning about warnings. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, again to the Premier. The Premier can speak to any governor she likes. She can speak to any Premier she likes, and they're all happy with Ontario's energy policy because we're sending jobs to every other state, jobs to every other province, because our energy policy is a disaster. We are giving away electricity under this Premier's hydro plan, and she does not appreciate how it's hurting families. Just last week in committee, we heard stories about how this is hurting Ontario. Norma Schmidt told the Legislative Committee that this Liberal plan is a slap in the face to Ontario. Margaret Thomas from Brussels said when it comes to hydro, there is no joy in rural and northern households. Terence Green, says, who lives in Ottawa South, called the rebate simply window dressing. So, Mr. Speaker, we've heard it at committee, we've heard it around the province. Why won't the Premier act? Why won't the Premier help? Is it because, is it because she took $1.3 million in donations? Is that the only reason she refuses to actually fix the hydro problem? Thank you. 
considered this. Um, the, the previous way in which the, the uh, leader was making reference to that uh, issue was okay. Now he's getting close to uh, impugning motive and uh, assigning blame. So I'm going to remind him that if it happens again, I'm going to ask him to withdraw. Premier. Minister of Energy. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to rise. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for people to understand that this is uh, an opportunity for me to hear clearly. I don't want the interjections to stop me from hearing and making announcements in the House. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, once again, I'm pleased to rise to address the questions by the uh, Leader of the Opposition. Um, Mr. Speaker, as we've said, we've invested in a modernized uh, electric electricity system, Mr. Speaker, and we took a dirty system and made it clean by completely eliminating dirty coal fire generation, <laughs> meaning Ontario has a cleaner future, Mr. Speaker. We don't have to send out warnings, Mr. Speaker, anymore, telling people not to go outside and breathe, Mr. Speaker, something that that government, when they were in power, had to do on almost a daily basis, Mr. Speaker. You know what, Mr. Speaker? Families in Ontario now will have the Ontario— uh, That's not being helpful either. Next time, we're moving to warnings. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the, that, that act, Mr. Speaker, is instant and permanent uh, come January yes, 1st, Mr. Speaker. 8% reduction to all families right across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank and that's you. one thing that's benefiting families. Here, here. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. This is a government that has lost their way. This is a government with misplaced priorities. The Liberals have no problem paying $4 million to the CEO of Hydro One, while the Quebec counterpart in that same position gets $400,000. The Liberals have no problem spending nearly $7 million for high-priced consultants just to tell them how to sell Hydro One. But when it comes to helping people in need, when it comes to helping Yes I Can Nursery, which helps children with autism, the government is lost. The government's Shame. voice is lost. Shame. Soon, 130 children with autism, their childcare spaces will be gone because of this government. Mr. Speaker, does the Premier value a $4 million CEO more than 130 children with autism in her riding? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I have said to the Leader of the Opposition, I have worked very closely with Yes I Can Nursery School over the years, yes, Mr. Speaker. Sure. I think it is a, a terrific program, and it's a mixed program. Not all of the, uh, the kids at Yes I Can uh, are on the autism spectrum, but uh, a number are, Mr. Speaker. There is $300,000 of uh, provincial money that flows to the municipality of Toronto and that goes to uh, Yes I Can. That uh, support stays in place, Mr. Speaker. We've been very clear that uh, if the leadership at Yes I Can can. We'll sit down with the City of Toronto provincial officials. We'll uh, work with them to, uh, to find a way to, to work with them so that there's a budget and a, su a sustainability plan over, uh, over the next few years, Mr. Speaker. We've been very clear about that. And as I said, in the interim, yes, that $300,000 a year continues to flow to Yes, I Can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, it really is incredible hearing the Liberal talking points. They're saying Yes, I can still gets funding. Yes, I can has said they have no funding. No, the city councillor says there's no funding. The government, in their own correspondence, asked Yes, I can nursery for a wind down plan, and yet they're here today saying nothing has changed. 130 children are going to lose their childcare spaces, and we have a premier that's oblivious to it. You asked the nursery for a wind down plan, and they're going to close. They're going to close their doors in your right. It is wrong. Those children need help. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the Premier is, nine years ago she stood up for this nursery. Nine years ago— Stop the clock. We're moving to warnings. Uh, right after I say it, the member decides he just wants to do it. Watch it. We're moving to warnings. Finish your question, please. Mr. Speaker, nine years ago, the Premier promised these families, promised these children, that the provincial government would be by their side. My question is, today, the nursery question. is about to close because of this government's decision, because of this government trying to pull the funding. Will the Premier stand up today in the Legislature and say Thank she you. will not allow the nursery to close? Senator, please. Senator, please. 
Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, for 25 years, I've been advocating for a strong publicly funded education system. Yeah. Nine years ago, the leader of the opposition was a member of a government that had no interest in a child care policy across this country, Mr. Speaker. The reality is that I believe in the program at Yes, I Can. I believe that it's a strong program, Mr. Speaker. I believe that we should continue to fund that $300,000 that flows to the City of Toronto. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. The Minister of Transportation is warned. And there are others. And if I saw who's just did that, they would be warned too. Special dollars that flow, Mr. Speaker, to the City of Toronto and go to uh, the nursery school. Mr. Speaker, there needs to be a process whereby Yes I Can sits down with Answer. Toronto City officials, with provincial officials, to come up with a budgeting process that will make the nursery school sustainable. That's what I have said all along, nine years ago, and I'll do it. The member from uh, the member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. You have one sentence. I'm, I'm fine, Mr. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier says there's some flow through funding. The Executive Director of the Nursery says there is no flow through funding. Liberal Senator Jim Munson says this is absolutely a callous decision of the government. Liberals are saying that to this Liberal government. And then you've got the Toronto City Councillor saying the Premier is unequivocally wrong that there is a municipal mechanism for funding. So here we have the government has asked for a wind down a wind-down plan from Yes, I Can Nursery. This is the same government that took families with children with autism to court. This is the same government that we're going to kick off kids off wait lists for IBI therapy. They recognized in the spring that their cuts to autism was wrong. I'm asking them today, on behalf of the children with autism in Don Valley West, will they do the right thing, just like they did in the, in the spring, acknowledge they are wrong, and make sure these children are not abandoned? Do the right thing, please, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Yeah, you know what's coming. The member from Huron Bruce is warned. Premier. Associate Minister of Education, Early Years and Child Care. Associate Minister of Education, Early thank, Childhood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to start out by saying I find it a little bit rich that the member opposite is actually talking about child care and child care plans, because the member opposite and the party opposite have no plan when it comes to child care. We not only have a plan, we have been supporting childcare in this province to the tune of $1 billion annually. And of that money, $351.7 million is going to the City of Toronto to support childcare. So I really think that the member opposite really needs to look at the figures and understand what is happening when we talk about money flowing. The City of Toronto flows $300,000 to the Yes I Can Childcare Centre and they have that funding there. What the, minister, what the member opposite has been talking Answer. about is limited funding that was there for a sustainability plan, a sustainability plan with limits, and that was in a timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Warnings are free. New question, the Leader of the opposite, uh, Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, for 100 years, reliable, affordable public electricity powered an economy that led people from across the world to come to Ontario to build a life. It's one of the reasons my dad came here from Slovakia. But the cost of electricity today, Speaker, has businesses moving away, life getting harder, and people losing hope. People are being forced, Speaker, to choose between necessities because their bills are so high. I believe in Ontario, and so do the people I talk with every day, but they need to see change, and they need to see it now, Speaker. Will this Premier listen to what people need and stop the privatization of Hydro One. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, the leader of the third party talks about the history of, uh, of this province. Quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, if Conservative and NDP governments had made the investments that were necessary in our electricity and in our infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, we wouldn't have been in the mess that we were in by 2003. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, we had to invest in a neglected electricity system. We, it needed to be cleaner. It needed to be upgraded. We did that, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize that there's a cost associated with that. But we also recognize that had we not made the decisions that we made, had we not shut down the coal-fired plants, had we not invested in renewable energy, Mr. Speaker, we would not have the, the uh, clean air that we have now, Mr. Speaker. We would not have avoided four billion dollars in health care and associated costs, Mr. Speaker, and the decision around Hydro One, if we had not made that decision, we would not be able to invest in the infrastructure that, again, Mr. Answer. Speaker, has been neglected by previous governments. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, had we not had consecutive Liberal and Conservative governments privatizing our electricity systems, we wouldn't have the kind of rates that we have. Let me tell you about Ernest Warner, Speaker. He lives in my riding. His, he and his wife are retired, and they are on a fixed income. Ernie's got in touch with my office because his wife uh, is on dialysis, and they've seen their hydro bill increase by 20 per cent in just the last couple of months. Ernie wrote, quote, my last bill was for $540 plus an added $220 in the so-called delivery and regulatory charges. They don't qualify for any help, Speaker. They don't qualify, but they still need to run that dialysis machine, whether it's, whether it's peak hours or not. She needs that dialysis. The Warners cannot afford privatization. Will this Premier Question. stop any further privatization of Hydro One? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, let me just uh, address the issue of the family who, uh, who is in this distress, Mr. Speaker. I hope that there's been a full exploration by them, with the help of the, with the help of the leader of the third party, that to look at what actually they might. Call. Because there are a number of programs, and I don't know the details of the situation, Mr. Speaker, but in terms of the Ontario Energy Support Program, the property tax and electricity credit, Mr. Speaker, they certainly will qualify for the 8% uh, reduction on their bill. But, Mr. Speaker, I recognize that in a situation like that, that is a family that does need support. And as I said, I hope that there would be a full exploration with them of what, they, what the options might be. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, this Premier is not listening once again. They don't qualify for any of the programs. They still have to put the dialysis machine on. They can't afford to do that. Students can't afford to pay for hydro and pay off their student loans. Families can't afford to pay for hydro and pay for childcare in this province at the same time. But instead of stopping the sell-off of Hydro One, the Premier is now greasing the wheels for the privatization of local hydro. I'm sorry, but there's dialogue going on between both, uh, so I'm just going to ask for everyone to uh, <coughs> rest, please. Leader. Here is now greasing the wheels for the sell-off of local hydro utilities. People cannot afford privatized, for-profit hydro in the province of Question. Ontario. Will the Premier stop all of these sell-offs now? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, there are many programs that are out uh, in the province right now to help families that are having a difficult time, Mr. Speaker, with, with uh, some of the costs with electricity, and we recognize that, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we acted with our three-point plan, Mr. Speaker, to help them come January 1st, when we get the legislation passed, to ensure that there's the 8 percent reduction, to ensure that there's a 20 percent reduction for families in northern, remote, and rural communities, Mr. Speaker. It is also very important to note, Mr. Speaker, that the OESP program is there to help families that need to use medical equipment. It goes up to $75 a month, Mr. Speaker. So I encourage every MPP and every family that needs this type of assistance, Mr. Speaker, to follow up with their local utility because they can make sure that there are systems in place to help these families, Mr. Speaker. Together, the utilities and the government are working together to continue to help families, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to Toronto Answer. Hydro, Mr. Speaker, that's a decision for Council. We've been saying that over and over again. Thank you Thank very you. much. New question.
the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Many Ontarians are finding it harder than ever for, before to pay for things like decent childcare, to pay off student loans, to pay their hydro bills. Many are finding it much, much harder to secure a future for themselves and their children. While bills go up, however, wages are staying flat. One in three people in Ontario earns a low or minimum wage. Will this Premier take action and agree today that instead of raising the minimum wage by 15 cents, she raises it to $15 an hour? Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Labour will want to speak to the process we've put in place that raises the minimum wage in a, in a way that, uh, that uh, looks at the cost of living, Mr. Speaker, and removes it from a political decision-making process that meant that for over a decade there was no increase in uh, the minimum yeah, wage. But, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party talked about some of the things that, uh, that challenge people. And those issues, like the cost of tuition, are exactly why we have put in place a free tuition as of uh, September 2017, Mr. Speaker, for 150,000 students in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. You know the the, uh, the announcement we made the other day about uh, yeah. hospital parking, Mr. Speaker. I had someone come up to me last night and thank me for uh, for that decision. So we understand that there are challenges that people are facing, and the changes that we are making, including one that the uh, leader of the third party advocated for, which is taking the provincial portion of the HST off uh, electricity prices. We're doing those things, Mr. Speaker, for exactly the reasons that the uh, leader of the third party outlined. The member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the process that this Premier is so proud of will have the minimum wage go to $15 an hour and sometime 20 years from now. 20 years from now or more, the, this province will have a $15 minimum wage under the Liberal plan. It's not good enough, Speaker. There are things that we need to do now to make sure people can have a decent job and a decent living. We call for some of those things, Speaker. Of course, the $15 minimum wage is one of them. We want to make it easier for folks to, to join a, um, a union, which is the best ticket into the middle class in this province, and make sure that they can get a first contract when they do so. There's no reason in this province why temp workers should be uh, pay, should not be the paid the same rate and get the same benefits as the people that they're working right beside in the same workplace. Speaker, the list goes on and on and on. When will this government start taking action to improve the quality Question. of work in this province, like, for example, increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Speaker, it's a pleasure to rise in the House and address the questions from uh, the member opposite. I think when you look at the province of Ontario, Speaker, what you have in place is a model that other provinces are starting to emulate. They're looking at the predictability, they're looking at the stability. What we did, Speaker, before we put these rules in place that allow the minimum wage to increase year after year, we went out to the community, we talked to business, we talked to labour, we talked to poverty advocates, we talked to everybody that had an interest in this, Speaker. The people who appear not to have an interest, didn't make one submission to the panel, right. was the New Democratic yeah. Party. If there was one party that I would have thought stepped up when the time was right to give their opinion on how to have predictability and stability in the minimum wage process, it would have been the people that are asking the question, Answer. Speaker. They can do better than that. Ontario is doing better today. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, they're doing a lot of looking and a lot of talking, but they sure aren't acting to make change in this province to bring people who are working out of poverty, Speaker. It is shameful that people working full-time in this province do not earn enough money to put food on the table and a roof over their head. The Premier likes to talk about her 15 cent increase to minimum wage, Speaker, but people in Ontario are at a breaking point, and they know that 15 cents simply is not enough. People need good jobs, and they want to know that the next generation is going to have the kind of jobs that you can actually build a good life on right here in this province. They need a $15 minimum wage. They should be able to join a union. They should be paid fairly for the work that they do. People want to know there's a future for them and for their kids here in this province. Will this Premier take the first step today and make Question. a commitment to bring Ontario's minimum wage to $15 an hour? Thank you. Speaker, thank you once again to the member for this question. Uh, 
The Changing Workplaces Review that we put in place with two expert advisors are addressing a lot of the issues that are being raised in the House today, Speaker. The OFL has been a partner in that. They're stepping to the plate. They're bringing forward good ideas. They're bringing forward recommendations as to how we can make this province a competitive province globally with good jobs, with decency in the workplace, Speaker. I would remind the member that between 96 and 2003, people who earned the minimum wage in this province received not one single increase, Speaker. Yep. Zero. That was frozen Arctic at 685. Frozen. Since Arctic. we've been in power since 2003, Speaker, Arctic we've policy. increased the minimum wage 10 times. Yeah. Up until very recently, we were the leading province in Confederation, Speaker. We've, in, we've put predictability into the system, Answer. stability into the system, Speaker, and it's working. It's about time the new Democrats got on board. New question, the member from Nathan Carlton. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the President of the Treasury Board. I think the headline of the Toronto Sun's editorial summed it up best. <laughs> Auditor General Bonnie, quote, listen. Order, please. At the right moment, you won't know when I'm going to offer you a free warning. So let's go back to this. Quote, Lissick more credible than the Liberals. They asked themselves, quote, who to believe, and quickly came to the same conclusion everyone else in Ontario did. They said, quote, they believe Lissick, an independent, non-partisan officer who works for the legislature, not the ruling Liberal Party. Minister the of Agriculture is warm. Quote, a chartered accountant, a certified internal auditor, and has a master's degree in business administration. What does the government has? Well, $305 billion in growing in debt. So, Mr. Speaker, I know who we believe on this side of the House, Question. but I ask you, why would or should anyone in the province of Ontario believe in this Liberal government's numbers? Please. Thank you, President Treasury Board. Well, just let's try this one more time, Speaker. We used the Auditor General's numbers. That's what we presented. The numbers we presented in the unaudited financial accounts show a five billion dollar deficit. That is the number proposed by the auditor. Yep. We showed her accumulated debt number, the number proposed by the auditor. So, if you believe the auditor, then you, you believe us. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I thought it was the Ontario Legislature, not at Second City right now. but. Uh, Listen, despite their best efforts to bully the people of Ontario through the Auditor General, uh, the Minister of Infrastructure during his time at Energy decided he would attempt to bully the uh, Auditor General as well. Now, the President of the Treasury Board and the Minister of Finance are trying to bully her and try to get her to change her numbers, and it won't work. They actually still owe her disclosure forms. They know that, but they're not forthcoming. As the Minister said, quote, given the discrepancy of opinion, we do need to get some independent third-party Advice to help sort this out. So here's the reality. We already have an independent third party auditor. Her name is Bonnie Lissick. And we support her on this side of the House Speaker. So I ask the President of the Treasury Board, will she cancel the third party external audit immediately? Will she stop wasting taxpayer dollars? And will she accept the auditor's numbers immediately? Thank you. Can you see it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you. President. So let's replay this one more time. We have an opinion from the public servants of Ontario, with whom uh, we high in the great, hold in the greatest regard. The opinion of the public servants gives us one set of numbers. 
which are the set of numbers that have been used and approved by auditors and the public service for 14 years, that have been approved for the last 14 years by four auditors, including for two years by the current auditor. And on the other hand, we have a new opinion from the Auditor General on a different accounting treatment from the one that has been used for the last 14 years. Cabinet had to figure out what to put in the count. We had two conflicting pieces of advice. And we chose Answer. by regulation the auditor's number. So I repeat, we chose the auditor's number, but we do need to I'm standing. You're finished. New question, the member from Kitchener Waterloo. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, for the first time in history, a provincial government is trying to go around the Auditor General by releasing an unaudited version of the public accounts. And if that wasn't unusual enough, there are whole sections missing. There are no statements from the Ontario Electricity Financial Corporation, and so we have no idea what happened to the Hydro One proceeds that were supposed to pay down the hydro debt, or what happened to the $2.6 billion departure tax that the government paid to the OEFC on Hydro One's behalf. The OEFC exists entirely within the Treasury. They work just down the hall from the same people who prepared these unaudited public accounts. So I ask, where are the OEFC financial statements? Sorry about that, Speaker. Um, so what I would like to assure the, me the member is that uh, when we table the public counts, and as I explained yesterday, uh, once we uh, have the advice of the auditor in terms of her audit opinion and have gone through the various <laughs> legal approval steps that have to follow along from that, we will be formally tabling the public accounts. And I wish to assure the members that uh, if there have been one or two of the uh, agencies that have inadvertently been omitted, they will certainly be in the public accounts. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, that does not instill a lot of confidence in the public accounts. And, Speaker, it's not acceptable to the people of this province. The OEFC statements weren't the only thing missing. They were not the only report that was missing. So were the statements from the former Hydro, Hydro One Brampton, and so were the statements from the WSIB. The CEO of the WSIB is Tom Tehan, the former uh, chief of staff for the Premier. My question is to the Premier, Speaker. Why couldn't she persuade her former Chief of Staff to submit the WSIB's financial statements on time? Uh, all of the information is available, and it will be available when we table the public accounts. And uh, as we have explained before, uh, the public accounts uh, require the opinion of the auditor, and when we have the opinion of the auditor, we will go forward with the formal process that completes the uh, finalizing of the public accounts. That will involve going to Cabinet, going to the Lieutenant Governor, obviously having the formal printing, and when all that has been accomplished, we will table the public accounts. At the moment, I'm awaiting this uh, audit opinion from the auditor, but the public accounts will obviously include all the required information. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour. Speaker, we continue to hear more and more about precarious work and the nature of changing jobs in our province. In today's workplace, people are no longer keeping traditional nine to five business days or taking weekends off. It is common for Ontarians to be self-employed or have part-time and temporary employment. As a government, we need to ensure that we do all that we can to provide support for these ch changing workplaces. People in my riding of Barrie are asking for change. Businesses and workers want our laws to reflect the realities of the modern economy, and we must ensure that we do just that. 
When the minister announced this government's changing workplaces consultations, I was happy to hear that this is something we are taking seriously. Speaker, can the minister please provide this House with an update on these consultations? Answer, uh, minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that excellent question. I'm really happy to stand in the House to, um, to provide the House with an update on our changing workplaces consultations. I'm especially happy to be here to, to thank Chris Buckley, to thank the OFL for the attitude and the approach they have brought to this consultation. They've been a very strong partner throughout the whole process. They've attended consultations. They've given us a report speaker with 24 recommendations attached. They continue to engage with us. They bring forward constructive ideas on how to make Ontario, Speaker, the best province to do business in and to work in as well, Speaker. In a Wait. We've also heard from business, from hundreds of other individuals, and from groups, speaker, from all areas of the province. After speaking with all these different groups, speaker, the advisors have put together an interim report. They've outlined the ideas that are shared with Answer. them. Speaker, the uh, consultations close October the 14th. I would urge all members to make sure they have their Thank views. You. In. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the minister for his answer. I'm happy to hear that so many people engaged with the special advisors on, on the Changing Workplaces Review. As the minister has said before, the Changing Workplaces Review is the first comprehensive review of Ontario's Labour Relations Act 1995 and Employment Standards Act 2000. This is an exceptional opportunity that we have to make sure that we provide protection for workers and that we help businesses prosper in our province. I know that the people of Barrie work hard each and every day and are looking forward to seeing how the Changing Workplaces Review will make their everyday lives that much better. Can the minister please tell us more about the interim report and what the next steps are in updating the Labour Relations Act? and the employment standards. Question. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to uh, thank the member for the question again and also thank her for her own personal involvement in the important review. Speaker, the special advisors have heard more than 200 presentations. Wow. They've received about 300 submissions to date from, uh, from stakeholders and other groups. After reading the submissions, speaking to all of the different group speakers, the advisors put together an interim report outlining all the ideas that have been shared with them. It's important to remember these ideas are not final recommendations, Speaker. They're some of the options that people brought forward to the special advisors. They're considering these options. They're combining them with uh, ongoing information. They're bringing in the years of knowledge and the expertise that they bring to the task, Speaker. The recommendations are going to help us protect workers and support business in the province of Ontario. Yes, Ontario sir. needs to remain a place where workers feel safe and secure and business is competitive, Speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. No questions? The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. Through a Freedom of Information request, we learned and yet another government initiative has ended in failure. After more than two years, the government abandoned their plans to modernize OLG, but not before sticking the Ontario taxpayers with another hefty bill. OLG's annual report indicates the government spent $190 million towards modernization in 2012-13, wow. $69 million wow. more in 2013-14, wow. and a further $49 million in 2014-15. When asked where the money was spent, the government said, quote, access to the records is denied. What? $308 million spent with no paper trail and absolutely nothing to show for it in return. So I ask the minister, will you release a Question. detailed account of where that money went? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as the member opposite has just noted, there's a tremendous amount of contributions that the OLG makes to the province, a dividend that's used to supply and support 
schools and hospitals and communities to the tune of $2 billion last year alone, Mr. Speaker. And as we proceed forward, the release of those reports are being made and, uh, and all of it is being open and transparent. We recognize that we need to continue to modernize, provide further savings. What the member opposite doesn't talk about is the degree of investments necessary right now to bring some of those establishments into the modern era. Continuously, we're looking at that as we did with lottery. We recognize the importance that it has for Sault Ste. Marie and its employees. We want to ensure that the communities that are providing some of these services have the investments necessary to, again, provide better service as well as appropriate social programs to protect consumers in, the, in this area. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. The failed ORPP scheme cost Ontario taxpayers $70 million and delivered $0 in benefits. But through our information request, Speaker, we learned the government spent $308 million on another abandoned initiative. And it's funny the minister mentioned hospitals because to help pay for this blunder, the government cut $107 million from OLG's transfer to hospitals, what? Speaker. Oh. They're cutting frontline health care services that Ontario families and seniors rely on most. They're attempting to balance their budget on on the backs of our most vulnerable yeah. speaker. Yeah. Another $308 million has been spent with zero accountability, and our hospitals are now paying for the Liberals' waste, mismanagement, Washington. and scandal. I asked the minister, what else are you hiding? Thank you. Minister? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, as we noted, we're modernizing the OLG, recognizing that more uh, can be available to help Ontario communities. And in fact, uh, a lottery sales last year was a record $3.8 billion. And since 1975, OLG has provided $42 billion to the province of the people of Ontario. All of these payments go to support our hospitals, schools, as well as prevention for gambling and other matters, Mr. Speaker. And we have continuously noted that we need to do more in order to provide for some of those services to those communities. And when the member opposite talks about disclosure, we have been doing just that. In fact, we did it recently, ensuring that we have the information available to the public, notwithstanding the time delays that may occur. And that is all the more reason why we provided the year in financial statements to the public and to this House. We'll continue to do so, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker. And the Auditor General, even today, was asked if the numbers were correct, and she states, I think they got it right on the bottom line. She, too, has noted that the numbers that we presented were her numbers, Mr. Speaker. New question. The member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. A new report shows that London has deep, entrenched poverty, a situation the report authors call brutal. 35,000 Londoners live in extreme poverty, and almost 8 per cent are jobless. For individuals, that equates to an income of 11,000, and for a lone parent, 19,000 per year. The City of London has taken a stand against poverty by calling for an end to poverty in one generation and by establishing a living wage. When will the Premier agree to a $15 minimum wage to help raise those 35,000 people out of extreme poverty? Thank you. The Minister responsible for poverty reduction. Responsible for poverty reduction, Minister of Housing. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes, and it is deeply troubling to hear uh, about those uh, struggling in poverty, those sliding into poverty, and those that, uh, through our poverty reduction strategy, we're on our, our second uh, uh, poverty reduction strategy, Mr. Speaker, and there's a, there's an awful lot of, of good news coming out of that. The uh, the the. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I just wanted to, uh, to remind uh, the members that the 2016 budget advances our poverty reduction strategy with, with commitments to providing people with the tools and the supports they need to meet their potential. Mr. Speaker, I can, I can refer back to the poverty reduction report of, uh, of last year Answer. That, that speaks to 47,000 children across this province raised out of poverty, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. When people get a fair paycheck, it means they can plan a future for their families. 
My city has been a centre of commerce and was once a hub for good-paying manufacturing jobs in southwestern Ontario. Londoners are skilled and hard-working people, but as you have heard, there are too many who are vulnerable. People need hope for the future. Does the Premier support a $15 minimum wage? Minister. Uh, Minister. <laughs> Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, Mr. Speaker, this job is is bent on ensuring that we, we continue to create jobs across this province. But southwestern Ontario is very much on the upswing when it comes to job creation, and London's a very big part of that. You know, with our Southwest Ontario Development Fund, we've invested $43 million. Uh, that's $573 million of private sector investment we've, we've brought, it, brought forward. That's 2,100 jobs created in that region alone from those investments. So we care very much about that part of the province, and we're working very hard to continue to grow the economy. Because, Mr. Speaker, that is the key to helping those folks, Mr. Speaker, who are out of work, is to find them employment. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we're leading the country in growth, because we continue to work with our business community to ensure we continue to grow those jobs and work with our local communities to help them Thank grow you. those jobs. And London's a shining example Thank of you. that. New question? The member from Durham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Ontarians deserve well-planned, sustainable, vibrant communities such as we have in the riding of Durham. That's why our, our government has been reviewing its land use plans and the province's land use planning system to ensure that the system is evolving to best meet the needs of Ontarians. For example, changes in Bill 73, the Smart Growth for Ontario Communities Act, passed last year, give greater deference to municipal decisions at the Ontario Municipal Board. I understand we are building on these efforts. The Ministry of, Munici Ministry of Municipal Affairs and the Ministry of the Attorney General are conducting comprehensive review of the Ontario Municipal Board. This morning, they made an announcement about the next stage of the review. Question. Would the minister please outline the details of the announcement he made this morning with the Attorney General? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Speaker, uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank the, uh, the member from Durham for the question. Uh, as he mentioned, Speaker, this morning, the Minister of the Attorney General and I made a joint announcement uh, downstairs in the media studio about the next phase of what Ontario will be doing when it comes to reviewing the Ontario Municipal Board. We're moving forward uh, today officially with the launch of a public uh, position paper that will be out for consultation on proposed changes and amendments to the, uh, to the OMB. Speaker. I do want to state, though, for people that while we made an announcement today on the next phase of what we've been doing, this is not the beginning of our work on the OMB. There has been significant other pieces of legislation and policy work, Speaker, that have been out for consultation, and through those legislative pieces and policy pieces during their consultation phase, also coming into that work was informing us Answer. on what we would be doing on the OMB. That work has found its way into this particular consultation paper, and we look forward to bringing that to the people of the province over the next 75 days. The Minister of Affairs for, for the answer. I know that many of my constituents will want to participate in this consultation especially my constituents at Wilmot Creek and Canterbury Commons. The minister mentioned that there will be a number of town halls across the province. These will provide opportunities for people to understand more about changes we are considering and to provide feedback of their own. I am glad to see our government is taking steps to improve the OMB so that it works better for all Ontarians. Speaker, while the Minister and the Attorney General are working to improve the OMB, some have suggested getting rid of the OMB altogether. How would the Minister respond to some of those who call to abolish the OMB? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, again, I thank the, uh, the member for his question, and he's right, Speaker. It is not our intention to eliminate the OMB. We believe that this independent appeal mechanism needs to remain a part of the land use planning policy framework uh, in the province of Ontario. Those who will have suggested that perhaps it should be eliminated have not suggested what might replace it 
or what would those people that wanted to appeal a local decision, what might they do? We think it goes very much, Speaker, to the core of affordability and accessibility. We are, however, uh, referencing and trying, we think, uh, through our proposed amendments, provide potential deference for local decision-making. My half of the review, Speaker, will deal with a scoping exercise, and that will mean that we are going to consult on potential changes to the OMB where we may not allow specific pieces that currently can be appealed to the OMB to no longer be appeal yes, appealed forward. So through that mechanism, we're hoping to allow more deference for local decision making. And as I said, Speaker, we look forward over the course of 12 town halls Thank in the you. next 75 days bringing this to the people of the province. Thank you. New question, the member from uh, Kitchener, Conestoga. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Two weeks ago, the minister's refusal to address a long-simmering dispute of dump truck load restrictions spilled out along GTA highways over three days of a costly protest. For three days, the minister remained silent as highways jammed and aggregate pits were picketed with motors and truckers paying the price in time and long-delayed transport delivery. That's because after years of failing to address axle weight restrictions that had long been under a moratorium, Instead of developing a solution with dump truck operators and contractors, this minister simply pulled the rug out and began issuing tickets. Speaker, now that the protest has forced an about face, will the minister explain why, after his government's decade plus of failure on load restrictions, we should believe talks he's now proposed are anything more Question. than spinning the wheels? Thank you. Thanks for transportation. Uh, well, I, I, Thank, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. I guess I, I would begin by saying I suppose this question is better late than never, given that this, uh, this issue yeah, was resolved a number of days ago. I uh, had the opportunity, as did officials at the Ministry of Transportation, uh, as in fact did a number of members of the Government Caucus. Uh, we had uh, opportunities to speak with industry and to speak with those that were directly affected. Uh, it was important at all times, uh, from my perspective, to make sure that the system continued to move, literally, Speaker. Uh, to make sure that jobs weren't put at risk, and to also make sure that we could continue to build out as we are here in the province of Ontario in the infrastructure realm. I will say uh, that I have, uh, I have said to industry, and I look forward to the opportunity for us to sit down together uh, and to continue to have a discussion to make sure that we can land in a spot that's appropriate so that this vitally important industry, and I'm talking about the entire infrastructure spectrum here, uh, Speaker, can continue Answer. to do its work. To can continue to create jobs and continue to work closely with us in building Ontario up. Thanks very much. Supplementary. Well, going back to the moratorium really isn't a solution or a fix whatsoever. In fact, this government has had over a decade to fix it. He, as minister himself, has had two years. And instead of brokering a solution, the best he came up two with was months. to begin enforcement of a regulation he knew would put operators in violation. And then when the impact of his decision played out in long, costly traffic delays stretching down the 401, he remained mute before finally taking back where we started. No solution, no timelines for a decision, no end in sight. Will the minister continue to kick the can down the road, or will he commit to ensuring promised talks with stakeholders lead to a permanent solution on this important load restriction? Thank you. <laughs> Speaker, uh, thank you very much, and again, I thank the member opposite for the, for the follow-up question. I don't think anybody who knows me in this chamber or elsewhere would ever accuse me of being mute, Speaker, but, but, I, do, but I do appreciate the question. I will say I, I feel on this matter that there's a two-fold responsibility for the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, the, first, the first thing for me to consider at all times, of course, is to make sure that we maintain road and highway safety and to make sure that our roads and highways right around the province that this government is investing in remain in good working order. So that's number one, Speaker. But at the same time, we want to make sure that everybody in the infrastructure spectrum that is so crucial to Ontario's economy can continue to function responsibly and safely and productively. That's the work that the Ministry of Transportation is currently involved in with this industry, and we'll continue to work hard on it until we get it right. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Nickelbelt. Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Energy. For weeks now, people from Northern and rural Ontario have been told by this minister that they are going to get a 20 percent reduction on their hydro bill. The minister stood in this house on September 27. He said, and I quote from Hansard, 
a 20 per cent reduction for families in rural, remote and northern community, like in my part of the province, will actually be a significant saving for many families." End of quote. The minister lives in the riding of Sudbury, and not one of his constituents will qualify for the 20 per cent in saving. Will the Will the minister correct his record and tell the people in his writing that they are not and will not be eligible for the 20 per cent in savings? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very happy to rise and answer this question because, as we do live in the city of Greater Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, many of the people that live in her riding will qualify for that 20 per cent reduction, like the 330,000 families right across the province, Mr. Speaker. So I'm very happy to rise up, Mr. Speaker, and talk about the great work that we're doing when it comes to making sure that we're putting an 8 per cent reduction Order. for those families right across the province. It doesn't matter where he's sitting. The member from Lamp Lambton, Kent, Middlesex, is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The purpose of the 20 per cent reduction is make sure, Mr. Speaker, that those that do live in rural, remote, or northern communities get that benefit that are under our two, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that they can actually have some savings on the delivery cost, which is high, Mr. Speaker. Northerners are very happy to have this benefit, Mr. Speaker, and I wish that the Thank NDP you. would be too, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the I, people are. I haven't recognized yet. Now I will. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the people of Sudbury are not the only one. The great majority of the 1.8 million people who live in remote, rural, and northern Ontario do not qualify for the 20 per cent in saving off their hydro bill. I get phone calls daily from people from Nickel Belt and Sudbury who are struggling with their hydro bill, and they want to know if they will be eligible for the 20 per cent savings or not. You see, Speaker, we have the member from Sudbury, the Minister of Energy, telling them that Northerners will get a 20 per cent saving on their hydro bill, but then they call Hydro One, and Hydro One tells them that they do not qualify for the saving. It would be helpful if the minister could correct his record and tell the people of his riding that they do not qualify, and frankly, Speaker, neither do most of the people in Nickel Belt. We don't qualify either for Question. the savings. Will the minister correct his record? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I think what the NDP need to do is understand the electricity system, Mr. Speaker, because they don't have a plan. They don't have any clue as to how this process is working, Mr. Speaker. 20 per cent is going to 330,000 families. Finish, please. The 20 per cent, Mr. Speaker, is going to 330,000 families right across the province, Mr. Speaker. Those families that are actually seeing their costs a lot higher than most folks in urban centres, Mr. Speaker. But we wanted to make sure that families right across the province, right across the province, will benefit, Mr. Speaker. They get 8 per cent, Mr. Speaker. Those that are in the rural or remote areas, Mr. Speaker, they get 20 per cent. Answer. That is something, Mr. Speaker, that we should all be proud of because this is significant savings, Mr. Speaker, for families coming from the opposition that has no plans on what to do. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. Drug-impaired driving is a public safety issue that is a concern for all of us. I had the opportunity to read the minister's op-ed in The Sun this past weekend, and it's clear to me that the minister understands the need, uh, the pressing need, for, federal, for, le for action given the prospect of federal legislation on the horizon. And I know that the minister uh, with his, met with his federal and provincial counterparts, and I'm sure this was an important topic of discussion when they met. Uh, Mr. Speaker, keeping Ontario, Ontario's roads safe is the most important job of the minister. Can the minister please provide an update on our government's ongoing efforts to keep roads safe from impaired, drug-impaired drivers? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Energy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I want to begin by thanking the member from Ottawa South, uh, not only for the question, but for also taking the time to read the op-ed uh, in question. It's much appreciated. It, wasn't, it was important to me, Speaker, for that op-ed to appear in the Ottawa Sun uh, because it's important to let Ontarians know that our government recognize, recognizes how pressing this particular issue is. 
And it's also important for us to make sure Ontarians understand that we are taking the necessary actions to address it. Speaker, in that op-ed, I talked about the path forward and what we need to do to get there. That path includes introducing tougher penalties that match those that are already in place for, al for alcohol-impaired driving, such as a $180 fine, a license suspension of three days for the first occurrence, and escalating sanctions thereafter. Speaker. Finally, this also includes the possibility of additional penalties Answer. after further testing at a police station. Our government's strong actions will help police get drug-impaired drivers off our roads faster, protecting more of our road users. Thanks thank very you. much, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the minister for his answer. And I'm pleased to hear that we've taken such strong action to combat drunk driving and drug-impaired driving. Mr. Speaker, this is an issue that's important to all of us, to all the families that we serve, and I cannot stress enough the importance of this issue. The Office of the Chief Coroner reported in 2013, 39% of drivers were, that were killed in Ontario's roads had alcohol, drugs, or both in their system. That's a shocking statistic, especially considering this is so preventable. So along with tougher penalties to tackle this issue, we need to have a multifaceted approach. And I know that the minister understands this. Could the minister, Mr. Speaker, could the minister please let members know what else our government is doing to address drug-impaired driving? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Speaker. I thank the member for the follow-up question. He is 100 percent right that combating, combating drug-impaired driving must go beyond simply tougher penalties. It's also important for us to change behaviors to avoid drug-impaired driving before it happens. Speaker, changing behaviors is done first and foremost through public education. I am proud that we are working closely with our safety partners, organizations like MAD Canada, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, Parachute Canada, and the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police on our public education efforts. At one point in time, I think we all recall, Speaker, unfortunately, that both drinking and driving and not wearing a seatbelt were considered acceptable practices, but no more, Speaker, thanks to public education. Our next challenge is to make sure that individuals come to see that driving high is the same as those practices that are no longer acceptable. Our government, in partnership with our safety partners, are up to this challenge. Yes, and when it comes to keeping roads safe here in the province of Ontario, we will not stop until we get the job done. Thanks very much, Thank Speaker. You. Question, the member from Lennox, Lennox Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Attorney General. The McDonald Laurier Institute released a report last month raking provinces on access to justice. Ontario ranked as one of the worst in the country in spite of the fact Ontario spends, outspends every other province. We spend more and we get less here in Liberal Ontario. The report once again shows that 43 per cent of all cases are either stayed or withdrawn before trial. That's an incredible number, Speaker, and demonstrates that either law enforcement or our courts are famous. Speaker, I've asked this question of academics to the uh, former Attorney General, to the current Attorney General, and no one can give me a straight answer. Speaker, will the Attorney General end the injustice and address this injustice that's in our justice system, or are there simply just too many Liberal fundraisers to attend to? Thank you. Attorney General. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. I, I appreciate the, the member who was asking a, a legitimate, serious question, and I'm disappointed by the way he ended the question, but that's, that's his prerogative. I, I don't agree with his characterization. Um, I speak of, this is a very important issue, and we always need to uh, work hard and ensure that we have uh, uh, access to the system, that we have a system in place that is fair uh, and, and effective uh, for, for everyone. And we recognize, Speaker, that there's always more to do, and I'm very much committed uh, to doing so. Ontario's uh, crowns share our commitment, Speaker, and I would like to thank them for their hard work and dedication every single day in all our communities across the province. In Ontario, Speaker, and I'm sure all members know this, that police are responsible for deciding when to lay charges based on the evidence they have gathered. The difference is that yes, in sir. provinces like British Columbia, New Brunswick, and Quebec, uh, you have a, a pre-charge system in place where Crown approved charges before they are laid. We need to factor in those type of Thank differences you. to know uh, when we're reading those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, uh, once again to the Attorney General. He knows this, but he has failed to do anything. Uh, and Speaker, these, this 43 per cent of state and withdrawn cases are not just numbers, they're actual people. One of those pre people is a highly decorated Afghan war vet who endured a multi-year criminal prosecution. 
that saw him barred from his hometown, lost custody of his, of his child. But he did get what he still has, and all the charges were withdrawn, all of them. But he still has a $200,000 debt. And what is the remedy for that this government? Nothing. Zero. No remedy. Speaker, for thousands of people, there is no access to justice in Ontario. And, Speaker, I expect, and the people of Ontario expect and demand that this minister do better and that our courts are actually used to protect people, not to persecute them. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Well, uh, Speaker, I take my responsibility as the Attorney General very, uh, uh, very seriously, and I will continue to strive to do better and better. Speaker, uh, we have uh, we have a system where, after charges are laid by the police, Crown begin its uh, assessment uh, of the strength of the case and the prospect that the case will result in a conviction. Crowns, Speaker, are required to do this at every stage of the case, even on the day of the trial vast majority of the cases, 66 per cent, scheduled for trial either proceed to trial or result in a guilty plea on the, on the trial date. The decision to end a prosecution speaker, can be one of the most difficult ones for the Crown to make. However, Crowns are duty-bound to stay or withdraw charges if there is no reasonable prospect of conviction or if it's not in the public interest to proceed. Speaker, we should be very proud that we live in one of the most safest jurisdictions in North America. Since 2005, our crime risk continues to go down every single year, and we will continue to work yes, together sir. along with the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services to ensure that Ontario remains a leader Thank in public you. safety across North America. Part of the member from Hamilton East, Stony Thank Creek. Thank you, Speaker. I'd just like to acknowledge and thank uh, Tegan Elliott, who is our page captain today. And Tegan's from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, and her mother, Christy, is in, in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.